Hi friends, it's Michelle from Quimby Cottage Knits. How are you today? It is a beautiful spring day here and we're planning on heading north to Quimby Cottage on April 30th, so that's in 24 days. I hope it warms up a little bit. It has been a little cool in the evenings there. It's still in the 30s, so fingers crossed. If you're new, I'm glad you're here. And if you're an old friend, thanks for coming today. I have just a few things I want to talk to you about and then I'm super eager to get outside and go for a walk and vacuum the cars and do those kinds of chores. So I just wanted to come on and talk to you for a few minutes. This is my, what is this? Magnolia cardigan. And I made it out of eco wool, Cascade eco wool, you can see. And it's pilled a little bit. I need to glean it, but that's for another day. That's a job for another day. I just threw it on over top of my t-shirt today and I will take it off before I go for my walk. So I just thought I'd let you know what I kind of threw on something a little bit nitty. I have a few things I want to share with you today, what I finished. I have been working hard. So first, I finally finished the baby stocking. So baby Theodore... Theodore was born at the end of March, I think maybe the 24th. I'm not, actually not sure. But anyway, he came and so I was able to, because he has no letters that hang down below this line, I was able to finish. So I did this little top edge and then I knit inside, just striped it and then folded it down. I did the name and then I did the loop. Okay, so as I was getting ready to share this with you today, I noticed something. So it's been sitting out like this, right? And I, it looks great. Theo, his name is, I mean, I don't know if he's going to go by Teddy or Theo or Theodore. I don't know. So Theo, that looks fine. And then all of a sudden, when I was taking pictures, I noticed that the O is a little bit tall. And then you can really see it when you do this. Okay, but let's talk about it for a second. In order to fix that, First of all, I did the this name kind of like cross stitch. So rather than doing like just the T and then moving over to the H and then the E, I did it sort of like cross stitch. So it's going to be messy inside there. But you can't see it because there's this beautiful, you know, liner that's folded in there. So that's why I didn't worry about it. So I did that. So this would be a mess to take out. And then secondly, when it hangs, you, it's only going to hang like this. And I don't think that the O is super obvious in that way. So I know it doesn't sound like something. I mean, I'm leaving it. I'm just leaving it. The point of all this whole story is that I'm leaving it because I don't want to take out all these letters. I don't want to unpick this seam that I did the, the lid on. I just don't want to do it. I want to be done with this. I want to be done with it. So it's going off to little Theo, but look how big it is. And isn't it beautiful and lovely? And it's the only thing I don't like about this pattern is I don't like the heel of this pattern. I think it's like too, like big, too heelish. But I think maybe if you had it stuffed full of stuff, you know, like maybe it wouldn't be so, you know, it would look more footish maybe. But I don't think a stocking needs to be actually like proportional to a sock. Because, you know, and the truth is if I, I already had knit the parents a pair of these socks for their wedding present. And then, so now this is the baby gift. I, if I were going to do these for myself, which I won't, but if I were going to do these for someone else, like if I wanted to ever do this again, I don't, but if I ever did, I would definitely shorten this foot part. I mean, I think it can go, let's do it this way. I mean, I think it could go, you know, like this much and then the, the toe. I would do a short row heel here, I think, but the pattern doesn't call for that. And I also wouldn't do this as long. I don't actually like stockings that are this long. Like to me, that's just way too much, but I already had done the parents and a lot of people like these traditional large stockings and I'm not, I mean, it's fine for you. It's just not okay for our family. So in our family, like our socks are maybe this big because you know, they're little. It's finished. I'm super glad it's done. This is called the Uncle Sock by Doreen Delaney Giordano. The Uncle Stocking, actually. Done. Going to go in the mail. Maybe tomorrow. Because it's too beautiful today to be fussing around with this. So that's the first thing I finished. 
The second thing I finished were, I'll finish, I'll say that last. The second thing I finished was this hat. So I had two balls of scrap yarn. I had used this for something. It's a cashmere blend. I used it for something a little bit, not very much. It was almost a full ball. And then I really had it in my head that I wanted to use this. This is self-striping sock yarn from a pair of socks that I did a while back. And I knew that I wanted to do this with it. So I just played around with it a little bit. I cast on 120 stitches, which I think is okay for fingering weight. I should try this on, actually. I had Sarita try it on the other day, and she said she thought it was a little tight, so it might be like more for a kid. But um, what I did was I did, every, I did a, some ribbing, 120 stitches. Then I did um, a row of gray, and then every other stitch of color and then a row of gray, and then I alternated the every other stitch of color. And I just did that until it was, you know, about to here. So what is that? Maybe seven and a half inches or so. And then I just, because I cast on 120, I divided by four, and that's 30. And then I just did decreases every other row. I did a decrease here and here, and then a decrease here and here, and a decrease here and here. So it's, it's kind of like turn a square, just that same method but I didn't follow that pattern and you can tell because you can see I have this kind of pucker but the way that I did that I was able to keep that alternate stitch without doing any extra work which I really liked that I could do that so this puckered a little bit I maybe should have I went until I only had two stitches on each needle and I maybe should have closed it off a little bit sooner because there is like a little bit of a nipple on that end or a little point but um I think it's fine. What's that? Oh, an end just popped out right there. I'll pull that through. So this was just, I just wanted to make the fabric. I had it in my head that I wanted to do it, so I just did it. It's not really a pattern, but it doesn't look bad though, right? This is like a fine spring hat, right? Super cute. So I, I think I'm just gonna put it in the gift bucket. It, it mostly just, I didn't need a new hat, but it mostly just satisfied that desire to make that pattern. So, you know, when you have to scratch an itch, that's how it goes, right? So I'm just going to actually leave this on for just a minute because it's kind of cute. Look how cute that is. So there you go. So I finished this hat. The hat that, you know, what is it called? I, I mean, just a hat. I just made a hat. Okay. So then, not on Easter, but because I was obsessed with, well, I'll tell you that in a second. One thing that I did also this week was I made a list of what I really want to put in the fair. So the county fair is coming in August and it's, I really wanted to make sure that I, I entered in something. Okay. And let's see, in 2018, I entered eight things into the fair and I found it to be really fun and really satisfying. So I wanted to duplicate that again. I had a couple of things that I could put in the fair last year in 2020. So wait, it was in 2019 that I entered the fair in 2020. I didn't put anything in, even though I had knit a couple things to go in because of it was canceled. But right now on the website, it says it is going to go through. So I made a list of what I could make, what I heart, I made a list of what I have made already. And then I made a list of what I could possibly make, but like didn't want to stress myself out between now and August, especially using yarn I already had. And in order to do that, I had to go on the fair website and look because they have categories that you enter. So you don't just, you know, submit your knitting. There's categories for the knitting. So you have to fit into the category. So one of the categories was a baby set. And I had been wanting to make a baby set for a while, not for a particular baby, but just when I was, in, when my kids were little, we lived in Massachusetts. And I had a friend there whose name was Ellen, E-L-I-N, Ellen. And she was from Iceland and her husband was from Norway. She and her mother and her sister were all knitters. And I'll never forget this. When I had my daughter, she had a son about the same, age, about the same time. Both of her boys are about the same age as my two girls. So when her second, I didn't know her really when her first son was born. We met because we were in the same play group. But 
when her second son was born, I noticed that he was always dressed in these white knitted things. And I thought it was so amazing and beautiful and elegant. And then she told me the secret. She, her mother and her sister all knit. Her sister lives in England and her sister was a bit older. So the sister had a baby. All three of the women knitted for that first baby, only in white. That first baby was a girl. So that baby wore all the whites. When Ellen had her son, the sister mailed all the things to her. She dressed her son in all that. When he was done with it, the sister was pregnant again, so she shipped it all back. The sister had another girl. That baby wore it when Ellen had her second child, who was also a boy, shipped it back, all white, all the babies wore it. And that idea just stuck in my head. I wished, I mean, it doesn't matter, but I really want that also. So I decided that I wanted to knit some white baby things also, not for my children, because I'm not having any more children. But what is that? just a thing but I will someday have grandchildren maybe so I decided that I wanted to knit some white things one day I was out and about and I bought a couple of balls of Malabrigo the washable fingering white yarn so I decided to knit a layout set and there's a little drama with it oh my god yeah there is a little drama with it so let's talk about that so first of all this is the bonnet and it's supposed to have ribbon tied like here down and I just didn't do that yet. So there's a little bit of finishing, sewing finishing that needs to be done in this. But this is the layout set by Stephanie Pearl McPhee, the yarn harlot. And it's called, she did it in French and I don't speak in the French. So it's called the Nouveau Né, Nouveau Né, it's French. So those of you who speak French, you can say it in your head and it will sound beautiful and elegant. And then I will just say it in my, from now on I'm gonna call it the baby layout set so that it doesn't hurt your ears because I know my Midwestern accent is just probably like fingernails on chalkboard. So anyway, that's the set. So it comes with this little bonnet and there's a ribbon and Stephanie Pearl McPhee, the pattern, she uses kind of a bronze brown color of ribbon, which is very elegant. I haven't decided what color ribbon yet to use because buttons. We'll talk about that in a minute. And here is the little sweater. Look how sweet that is. Isn't that sweet? You can see, it's just sweet. I think I added a bit of length here because I read in someone's pattern description, they said that they added a bit of length so that the baby could wear a little bit longer. And I seem to remember that even from my kids that the length kind of helps a little bit. So I did, I think, make this a pinch longer. So this is that. Now it needs buttons and I tossed all of my buttons and this is the button I think that fits in the hole the best. It's, I, it's maybe a 12 millimeter button, but this is plastic and I told you I want this to kind of be an heirloom. So I, I don't want to use this button. Also, this is a really bright yellow and I don't want that either. So in my head, I want either an elegant like bone button or I also in my head think that this would be super cute with a Peter Rabbit button. My girls were obsessed with the Peter Rabbit stories and they used to play on the playground. <laughs> they would pretend they would play like a game of chase and Mr. Hansen would have to be the farmer what was his name? McGregor, Mr. McGregor, because he, remember, do you remember? This is a little bit brutal, but remember Peter Rabbit's father was made into a pie by Mrs. McGregor. So my kids used to play this chase game with Mr. Hansen and they just loved it. And so those stories are very, have, they're fond for me. So I have an idea that I will either look for those buttons or I will look for just an elegant, you know, pottery button or glass button or vintage button or um, maybe a bone button that is that will fit this. So the holes are really small. I did go down a needle size. The, ne the yarn calls for, I'm sorry, the pattern calls for size two and a half needle, which I didn't have. I only had a two. So I just went down one because I figured it's stretch knitting and it will stretch. And I thought it would look nicer than if I had gone up a needle size. 
So some buttons that I considered, let's just go through my button choices for a second. I have a button jar like everyone does. You guys have a button jar, don't you? Of course you do. So I have a button jar also. And um, everybody knows I have a button jar. And actually for Christmas this year, Sabine gave me these buttons. They are vintage Gucci buttons. And look, they have a B on them. Can you see that? And I have six of them. I would need at least probably 10 to make a sweater for myself. These are too big. I mean, they're just, they're much too big. But I thought that they would be kind of cute with maybe red ties. Also, though, I, well, I don't know if I really think that Gucci buttons on a baby sweater are a thing, but they are going to be, you know, a vintage thing. So, so those were too big. They were kind of a last minute option. My first choice were these beautiful pottery buttons that actually were gifted to me, maybe for this sweater. Let's see if they would fit in this. Oh my gosh, they would fit in this sweater. Ooh, maybe I have to replace these. What do you think? Should I replace these with these? All the way down. It would dress it up a little bit. Maybe I'll do that. Anyway, these are just also slightly too big. They're actually almost perfect if they were round but they're square. See how they're square? See that? These are from Remembrance's Pottery. I shouldn't tell you all that because I don't know if she has buttons on a regular basis, but how lucky ducky was I. So these buttons were slightly too big. Then I went into my, and I keep them in this little paper box. Isn't this, look at, perfect for them. Then I looked, I have a few other special buttons. I have these Petoskey stone buttons, but these are obviously far too large. And I even like, Sometimes I go nuts and I buy things I don't need, like this giant button. I know this is going to be important and I'm going to use it for something, but I just don't know what yet. And then I have a couple of these little antler buttons, which I bought a number of years ago. And I thought I was going to make slippers and put these on the slippers for the cottage because I bought these up north. But no, so I don't have any. These are all too much too large. So I have a few of those buttons in there. So I went through all of my buttons, didn't find anything. So there's the button saga. Now let's talk about the booties. If you read the comments on the pattern for the Stephanie Pearl McPhee, the layout set, a lot of people comment that the booty pattern has errors in it. It's true. <laughs> it's true. It's true. So the first thing is that it has you do the pattern, which matches the sleeve and the, the cuff. This is that has you do this pattern, which is called the B-stitch. And then she has you knit nine, I think nine rows between here and here. It has to be eight or 10, it cannot be nine. So that's, that's definitely the mistake. It's easy to correct, but, and a lot of people just say, I had to add a row, but they don't tell you exactly where. So I'm telling you, this is where the mistake is, right here. The other thing I did was, so I made these and they were fine. And the, the last thing it says to do is to cast off and then sew it together, right? Well, I thought I know better. And so I did a Kitchener bind off, Kitchener graft. And so here's the first one. See the Kitchener. And then I did the same thing on this one. And for some reason I did one inside and one outside. And so there's this gap at the bottom. See that? So Here's the bottom of this one and the bottom of this one. You can see that they don't match. See that? See how the bottom doesn't match? Yeah. These are going to be fine for a baby gift. Nobody will notice. I will be able to give them. It's fine. But remember, I said I was going to make these for the fair also. So they also need ribbon. You're supposed to string a ribbon through this, which I'll do. And these, so these are gifts. So I had to re-knit them, which I did here, but these ones are blocked and these are not blocked. So friends, when you ask, do you need to block it? See how much like smoother and nicer these are than these. I know these look okay, but even like see how the, this doesn't want to lay flat. You don't see it as nicely and see how beautifully that is. Just, you have to block your knits. Oh my gosh. Now I wonder if there's another mistake in them. Look at these ones are much bigger. I'm going to have to look now at the pattern. Oh, darn it. 
what the heck is wrong with me? So this has two rows of B-stitch down here, and this one only has one row of B-stitch down here. These are still going in the fair, P.S., because I followed the pattern with the exception of this thing, and that, I think of all things, this is like matters the least. But probably, I bet you it's this. I bet you you're only supposed to have one because these do look a little bit big. I remember thinking when they, these were beside each other, I was like, hmm, that's weird that they're a little bit big. And then I thought, well, maybe when they block, they will. Nope. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, friends, you have to read the pattern. Okay, so these still need to be blocked. And then, I, as I said, I need ribbon to go through these. And I need ribbon to go here to tie that on. And then I need buttons for this. So there's a fiber festival in Ann Arbor this weekend. So I'm going to go there and see if there's any buttons there. Otherwise, I'm going to find myself on the Etsy. Pretty sure. So that's how we're going to take care of these. So these, this is almost completely finished. On my project page, I have it listed as not finished because it still has a little finishing work to do. But the knitting itself is done. And like I said, this will now go, I'll get some ribbon for this, and then these will go in the gift pile, which will be nice. It, it's just nice to have a little gift pile. And I, I rarely have an already made baby gift, so that's nice. Can I just tell you, though, how I blocked this? What I did was, so ideal, you're supposed to knit it like so, and then you knit it flat the rest of the way, but I just joined it in the round so I didn't have to seam right here. But clearly this is the back of the bonnet, right? So it kind of goes like, like that. And what I did was I, I didn't have a plate that's this small of a circumference. It's pretty small. What I did was I found a drinking glass that was about that kind of opening. And I, lay, I wet this and then I put it on top of the drinking glass so that it kind of went like so. And then the drinking glass was tall enough that the brim didn't, hang down on it just hung it didn't drag onto the counter or anything and that's how I blocked it so that it definitely has that round shape so there's probably another way or maybe you might have something that's round that fits perfectly like that I just didn't and so I kind of did a little improvise but I do think it will look a lot better when there's a little baby cat head inside I had I looked for fruit I really did I only had an orange and the orange was pretty small but if you had a grapefruit you could totally use a grapefruit or if you had balls around your house like maybe a softball would be fine but I didn't have that so that's how I blocked it just thought I'd let you know sometimes you have to improvise a little bit okay then while I was tossing the stash I found this angora that I bought at a fiber festival a number of years ago I planned on making something for my niece with this she when she was little was kind of obsessed with animal skins and she lives in the upper peninsula so you actually can have animal skins there like you can find them for sale and she used to carry you know them around I can't so anyway at one point she kind of realized that it wasn't very humane and so she asked if there was a way to get a humane animal skin poor thing Anyway, I figured the most humane thing that we could do for her is Angora. So I went to a fiber festival and this woman had all her little bunnies out and she combs them and she showed you how she combs them and they were all clearly used to being handled. And then she spins it into yarn. So this is 100% Angora. It was crazy expensive because they're her pets and she does all that work by hand. But I thought it would be good. So I bought this purple and then I bought a kind of a teal blue and I bought a couple balls of it and I knit the first one into a little scarf it wasn't very big and my niece was probably 10 or 11 maybe 10 when I did this and it was just a little scarf it went around her neck and then you could crisscross it right here and I think there was a little button that she could close it it was just meant to be something softer on her neck but when I asked her if she liked it she told me that her cat loves it and I don't knit for cats friends but maybe you do, and that's okay if you do, but I don't. So I still had two balls of that. And as I was doing this baby knitting, I thought, oh, maybe I could do some booties or something. Kind of want to use that up. 
And instead I found this little pattern for a bunny. And of course it would have been smart if I had made it on Easter, but I didn't. But look at this bunny, it's called Henry's Bunny. It's a free pattern on Ravelry. And it's by Sarah Elizabeth Kellner. Look at that, isn't it cute? So it has the little feet and then the little ears. I wish I had added a couple of more rounds on the ears because this yarn is a little thick and fuzzy. And so I think that the ears should have been a little bit longer. But I told you I had two balls and this is left over from the first ball. And then I had the second one too. So I might be able to get a whole nother bunny out of this. And maybe I will just to use it up. And then, but look at how cute this bunny is. And so he still needs a little, a little nose and some little eyes embroidered on him. But... Um, I just thought it was a cute little fun thing to do. Now, it would have been clever had I made it for Easter, and then I could have used it like on my table for Easter decoration, but I didn't, so there you go. But anyway, isn't he cute? And then I stuffed him on the inside. Remember when I was gleaning my sweaters? Was it last time or the time before that? And I had all that fluff left over? Some of his stuffing is that fluff. I just shoved it in there, so I thought that was a very clever use of leftovers and I'm pretty tickled by it. Can I tell you that? So that's that. I also finished my Magic Knot socks. Remember I said I was making those Magic Knot socks? So I finished the pair. Here they are. I remember I was doing matching heels because I was afraid I was gonna run out of yarn. Well, when I got to the toe of this sock, this was the second sock, I realized I had plenty of the ball left to do that. So I just went ahead and did that. So they only have matching heels. They're totally scrappy. So these are the magic knot socks. So I wore these once. Remember I said I would report to you how I felt in them? I wore them once. I can tell definitely there's a knot right here. I can feel it. So it's definitely on the bottom of the, of the sock. I wanted to tell you, I didn't feel at all the knots. I wore them just in my house. And then I also wore them in shoes and went for a walk. And I couldn't feel the knot at all. So I just wanted to report that to you. I still did not enjoy making the ball but if you enjoy making the balls I mean this is a great way to I think it would work but you have to make the ball early right it makes the, the knitting really easy because you just knit along as opposed to if you were doing scrappy socks and you were trying to count rows or something like that it might be a little bit more fussy there were no weaving in of the ends of this either so there's that and I remember I made two. Oh no yep I made two balls so this was my second ball and this is my sock and I just I was picking up the heel flap and I just pulled the needle out just now because my knee was underneath when I picked it up so I'm gonna have to put this back together very carefully so this is what I have on the needles right now and that's it because the baby the baby stuff I was just one after the other and then I did the bunny and so this is the only thing on the needle when I made my list of things I can make for the fair, I decided that I could probably finish a pair of socks, but I don't want to use these scrappy socks. I want them to be nice with a pattern of some kind. So I have to find something that I want to make. And I toss the stash and I think I'm going to use this yarn. Isn't that pretty? It's kind of a I mean, you can see I love this color because this like sort of caramel, butterscotchy color, those colors look really nice on me. I always say I look best in the baby poop color, so true. Anyway, I bought this. It has some yak in it. It is 70% merino, 20% yak, and 10% nylon, so it's definitely for socks or, you know, whatever else you wanted to. If I had had a jillion dollars, it was kind of expensive. If I had a jillion dollars when I bought it, I would have bought all of it and knit myself a fingering weight sweater, but I did not have a jillion dollars and you, sh you know, it's okay to try it a little bit on socks first and see if you like it before you spend a jillion dollars. So that's what I'm going to do. Anyway, this is going to be the next thing. So I still have to wind it into a ball, but isn't it beautiful? So lovely. Love it. So I'll let you know how that goes. But I think first, truthfully, the next thing I'm going to put on the needles is another one of those bunnies. That's all the knitting I have. So this is already 30 minutes. Okay, so here's the thing. I read a couple of books. I will quickly talk about them, but honestly, if books aren't a thing that you are interested in, let me know because I don't have to talk about my books. I just thought I would because, you know, sometimes I like to tell you what I'm reading. 
So I have finished three books since we last talked. One is A Distant Mirror by Barbara Tuchman. It is long. It was a tome. It's definitely a history book. It goes over the entire 14th century, like the 100 years. It talks about, it's mostly set in England and France, and it's mostly about the 100 Years War. The plague is talked about a lot, and there's a couple different, you know, iterations of the plague that come through. They talk about the Crusades, chivalry, science. Like one of the things I thought was really interesting is they said that science was able to take giant leaps and bounds once there was a clock so that you could measure time and then you could, you know, do experiments based on like at eight o'clock at night today, here's what we see in the sky. And then at eight o'clock tomorrow, here's what we see in the sky. So even though those observations were available, the 13th century when the clock was there kind of really started like kind of a bigger jump in science, which I thought was interesting. Anyway, that actually took me a while. I've been reading that for a while, but I just wanted to let you know that I finished it and it was good. I typically read a lot of nonfiction. The other book that I read that was really kind of heartbreaking is called Hand to Mouth by Linda Torado. Linda Torado. And it's about the working class. She's a working class person. She talks about the kinds of choices that she has had to make. She talks health wise and they're very honest just choices or why she makes certain choices because of the lack of other options that she has. So it's very eye opening. And, you know, my feeling about this is that I think the minimum wage needs to be raised because if anything that we've learned this year is that the, the essential workers are primarily our hourly workers, hourly workers who don't necessarily have a lot of skills, but they are hourly workers and they're essential. And why would we expect that people would continue to choose those jobs if they can't afford to keep them or they have to have two or three of them and they're literally essential and we are the ones that said they were essential. They already knew it. I could go on and on. Ultimately, if you want to know more about if you want to know more about what those what kinds of choices you have to make when your income is even more limited than yours is now, then I would recommend it. I I think it's very eye-opening. It's very realistic. And then, you know, afterwards I looked her up to find out where she is now because that's the kind of reader I am. And she is a freelance photographer and her left eye was shot out by the police in Minnesota during the um, George Floyd protests, which is its own thing. And now she has to sue the city for that. So I'm just going to leave that at that. Another book I read, which was recommended by a friend was called The Year of Less by Kate Flanders. That was really interesting. It's about a woman who goes on a shopping hiatus for one year and she keeps a journal and she used to have a blog or maybe she has a blog still where she talked about it. And then the book is an expansion of that experiment. She talks about the kinds of choices that she has made and what she's learned about herself. And it deals with other issues that she was working through, like maybe alcoholism and you know, some other issues along those lines too. But I found myself being drawn to the, to the things that she learned about herself after she stopped just buying and how she decided she wanted to be a more thoughtful consumer. And while I have no plans at all to go, I mean, to go on a shopping ban for a year or three months or even one week, I think it's interesting. And one of the things that I also thought was interesting is that in the epilogue, she talks about how the following year she kept track of what she used. That's actually really interesting to me. I've done that before. Sometimes I will write a date on something when I open it so that I can notice when I am done with it, how long it took to use it. So like, for example, I have, I really love that Dawn dish spray, the spray. I love it. And I go through about one a month. I only buy the refills. I still wish the packaging was less than what it is. Like it could come in a pouch maybe, or you could get maybe two and then pour them. Like I, but I don't buy the whole thing anymore. I just buy the refill. 
But it is interesting to me to pay attention to those kinds of things. And one of the things that she noticed is that when you do that, then you know that you don't have to stock up on certain things. So like she, for example, she, for herself, she used one bottle of, sh I'm sorry, two bottles of conditioner and two bottles of shampoo for the whole year, which I thought was really interesting. I don't know how, how much of that I use, but I think I use less in truth than I actually probably buy. If you, so I always have a stash of it in my house. So I thought that that was kind of an interesting, the interesting things. And I like to pay attention to that stuff. So that's enough of the books. I really, it's a beautiful day out and you, I know you don't want me to waste my day in here. And I know you don't want to waste your day in here talking to me either. So if it's the evening time for you, or if you're having a cup of tea right now and it's your morning or whatever time of day it is for you, I just want to say, I hope that you have a really good day. Thanks so much for stopping in. I'll talk to you soon.